Your Bibles, if you have them, and join me in Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, we are continuing our series in the first part of the book of Genesis, and we are continuing the story of the flood that we began last week. And so we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 7, verse 6, and I will read through verse 5 of chapter 8. So Genesis chapter 7, verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth." In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his son, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land and whose nostril was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed in the earth 150 days. But God remembered Noah, and all the beasts, and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens were restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. And at the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th day, until the 10th month, and the 10th month on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we once again ask for your help. We do come trusting that this is your word and that you are speaking to us presently through this word. Sometimes it's difficult to trust that. Sometimes it's difficult to understand what you are saying, and so we need your help this morning. We need your spirit to open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts, to receive what you are saying and to be changed by it. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. We're going on a bear hunt. It is one of the great children's books based on a folk rhyme. And many of you will know the plot of that b- book, the plot of that rhyme. It's a beautiful day, and so a family decides to go on a bear hunt, and they're going to catch a big one. And so they go through all of these obstacles, uh, the grass and the river and the mud and the forest and even a blinding snowstorm. And finally, they find their way to a cave, and they come face to face with a bear. And then what happens? Well, they're terrified, and they they sprint all the way back through those obstacles, and they come to their home, and they shut the door, and they lock the door, and they jump under the covers of the bed, and they say, we're not going on a bear hunt anymore. 
this morning could be like that book. Because we are here this morning not hunting a bear, but meeting God. We are here in worship to meet God. But the God whom we meet in his word, in the story we began last week and continued in what we've just read, the God we meet in these words is terrifying. The death and the destruction, all life blotted out. The death and the destruction of the flood is disturbing and overwhelming. And so what are we gonna do as we meet this terrifying God? Maybe some of us are tempted to run home and to lock the door and to pull up the covers and say no more, no more of that God. But I'm going to ask you not to do that this morning. I'm going to ask you to take a few moments with me. Let's take a few moments in the cave, face to face with the bear, and consider the God of the flood. And as we look at this text, and as we consider the God of the flood, we'll see that we should still want to meet, to belong to, to listen to, to worship this God, because he is Lord of the waters and Lord of the wind. First of all, he is Lord of the waters. We need always to keep in mind Genesis chapter 1. And how does the story of creation begin? Creation begins as tohu vovohu, right? Formless and void. It begins as darkness over the face of the deep. Everything begins as water. And God as the creator shows himself to be Lord over the waters. And he divides, he separates the waters above that come down from the sky and the waters below that bubble up from the ground. And then he gather the, gathers the waters below so that dry land appears, so that he can fill that dry land with waters and animals and ultimately humanity. And in the flood, God the creator, the ruler over the waters, takes down that structure. He takes away those boundaries. He removes the boundaries between the waters above and the waters below. And so in, uh, chapter, in chapter 7 tells us that the windows of heaven open and the fountains of the deep open and collapse. The water, the structure, the order that allowed for life collapses and covers the face of the dry ground, destroying all life on the dry dry ground. The flood is creation in reverse. It is God decreating, deconstructing the structures that allowed for life. He takes apart the order of his creation and returns all things to that original primal state of, of tohu vavohu of chaotic, formless water. And why does he do that? Well, we answered that question partly last week. Do you remember that the pattern of sin had multiplied and it had filled the world with violence and corruption and so the flood is God filling the world with what the world is already filled with. The chaos of the waters reveal the chaos of violence that had filled God's good creation. And so God reveals in the flood the nature and the effect of sin. But the waters of the flood are not only a revelation, they are also an opposition. God not only shows the nature and the effect of sin, he also opposes the nature and effect of sin. 
You notice what uh, chapter 7, verse 19 says about these waters. It says that they are mighty and they prevail. This is military language, and it directly echoes the language of chapter 6, verse 4 which shows us as the result of idolatry and sin that the world was filled with Nephilim, with mighty men. And it was these mighty men who filled the creation with the chaos of violence and vengeance and death. So do you notice the language connection? It is the mighty waters of God that confront and overcome these mighty men and what they had done with God's creation. The chaos of the waters confronts and overcomes the chaos of this violence and vengeance. The terrifying power of God confronts and overcomes the multiplying power of sin. And that's why we need the God of the flood. That's why we need the one who is Lord of the waters. Because we need the one who has the terrifying power to confront and overcome the multiplying power of sin. I was watching one of the bowl games at the end of the college football season last year, and the TV broadcast was showing some of the festive scenes around the stadium in preparation for the game. And, and one of the scenes that they showed was a, was a shot that showed all of the instruments of the marching band laid out on a concrete slab underneath the stadium which struck me as odd, and, and I looked closer, and I, and I noticed that uh, there was a man dressed in a, a law enforcement uniform leading a dog in between those instruments. It was a bomb-sniffing dog making sure that the tuba player wasn't sneaking a weapon into the game, which is depressing, isn't it? That our world is so full of violence and fear that even the marching band is not above suspicion. And that's why we need the God of the flood. That's why we need the Lord of the waters because the God of the flood shows us a God with the power to oppose and overcome and will in the end overcome the seamless, endlessly multiplication of evil. The flood shows us that the world will not always be that way that there is one who possesses terrifying power, who will stand against, and who will overcome the multiplication of the effects of sin on his creation. And we need that not only as hope for the future, but we need that presently and personally as hard as that is to hear. We need the God who has the power to say no to us. We need the God who has the wisdom and the power to oppose and overcome the multiplying effects of our sin in our life, in our relationships, and in our world. But still, that word, terrifying. <laughs> because isn't the no of God utterly overwhelming? Isn't the opposition of God utterly destructive? Well, this is where we need to see that the God of the flood is not only Lord of the water, he is also Lord of the wind. Did you notice how the vast majority of this text is not about the flood? 
is not about the waters. The vast majority of this text is about the animals and the people who process into the building project that God gave Noah last week. They process into this sanctuary of God's presence and protection. The vast majority of the text is about them. And you notice how chapter seven, verse 15 describes these animals and these people. They go with Noah two by two, all flesh in which are the breath of life. And this is another recall, this is another call back to the original creation and especially to Genesis chapter two when God breathes into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life. And so as the waters cover the dry land and destroy the breath of life on the dry land, God gathers into this sanctuary of his presence and his protection. He gathers and he preserves the breath of life in this sanctuary. And what happens as the waters cover the face of the dry ground? Where is this sanctuary of breath? Chapter 7, verse 18. It is floating over the face of the waters. Until chapter 8, verse 1, God causes a wind, which is the same word as breath, a ruach to blow. And what happens? Well, the structure the boundaries are put back in place. The windows of heaven and the fountains of the deep close and the waters abate and dry land begins to appear and the ark, this sanctuary of breath comes to rest on the first appearance of the dry land on a high mountain. Now where have we heard all of that language before? Genesis chapter one, verse two. When all things began as tohu vavohu, formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep, what else was over the face of the waters? It was the spirit, which is the same word as wind and breath. It is the ruach of God that hovered over the face of the waters, the exact language in Genesis chapter seven and eight. The spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters and that's what brought about the structure of creation. That's what allowed dry land and life to appear. So do you see the point? Do you see why the vast majority of this text is not devoted to the flood, is not devoted to the waters? It's because the flood reveals to us a God who doesn't only oppose, but a God who po opposes in order to restore, a God who deconstructs in order to reconstruct. It is the God who takes apart his creation, unmakes his creation so that he can remake it again, so that he can blow over it the wind of renewal, the breath of a new creation. And what causes that to happen? What causes that wind of renewal? Chapter 8, verse 1 again. What comes before the wind? It's God's memory. God remembered Noah, and that's why the wind blew. Now, that does not mean that God temporarily forgot Noah. This is almost technical language in the Bible for God beginning to act according to the relationship that he has with someone. So in the Exodus, he sees the suffering of his people, and Exodus chapter two says he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so he begins to act to rescue them. So that's what's happening here in Genesis seven and eight. God remembers the covenant that he had made with Noah in chapter six, and so he begins to act according to that relationship, the relationship that he had with 
with Noah. That's where this wind comes from. The wind of re- renewal is the result of God's loyal love to Noah. And this is why we need the God of the flood. Because he is not only Lord of the waters, but he is Lord of the wind. Because he is not only the God who opposes, but he imposes in order to restore. He unmakes in order to remake. He is the God who says no, so that he can say a better yes. The yes of a new creation. But how do we know that we belong to the memory of God? How do we know that we belong to the memory of God that produces this wind of renewal? Well, we know that because a woman named Mary sang a song celebrating the coming birth of her son. Her son that was the result of the spirit, the presence, the breath of God overshadowing her womb. And so as Mary sings in celebration of that coming birth, and this is in Luke chapter one, she says that birth is happening because God has remembered his mercy. And then a few verses later, a man named Zechariah, whose name means God remembers. He sings a song in celebration of the birth of his son, John, who will point people towards Mary's son, Jesus. And Zechariah says, all of this is happening because God has remembered his holy covenant. Which is why Mary's son, as he sits down at that meal the night before he died with his friends, hands to them a cup and says, this is my blood, and it is the blood of the new covenant. It is the blood of this relationship that God remembers. And then he went to the cross and he suffered that judgment. He suffered the no. He suffered the opposition that our sin deserves, but then he rose with the yes of a new creation, and then he ascended into heaven, and he gave his spirit, the spirit that hovered over the face of the waters, he gave his spirit to his church, to the community of people who belong to him, and what did it sound like when he gave his spirit to them in Acts chapter two? It was a mighty rushing wind. You see, it is in Jesus that you belong to the memory of God. By repentance and faith in Jesus, God is breathing into your life this wind of renewal and is filling his creation, this chaotic world with the renewal that comes from his presence. In Jesus, you belong to the God who opposes so that he can restore. You belong to the God who will deconstruct, but so that he can reconstruct something even better. You belong to the God who will say no, to your sin, but who says no so that he can say an unimaginably beautiful yes of new creation over your life. So what would it look like tomorrow for you to wake up assured that God remembers you. To wake up tomorrow and know that whatever happens this week, God remembers you like he remembered Noah. In Christ, he remembers you 
and through your life is filling the chaos of a world broken by sin with the beauty and the goodness and the order of his new creation. What would it look like for you to live assured of that? So we're going on a bear hunt. Ends, at least the book ends, not with no more bear hunting. No, the book ends with the bear sadly trudging back to his cave. Sad because he wanted to meet and befriend this family who is so afraid of him. That's not how the flood story ends. The flood does not end with God sadly forever turning his back on his creation. No, the flood shows us, yes, that they're a God of terrifying power, but also and even more a God of renewing love. And by his Son and Spirit, he does not leave us in the locked door of our fear. But he has come to make his home with us. So open the door. Unlock the door. Open the door of your life to this terrifying God. Why? Well, because he has opened the door of his sanctuary. He has opened the door of his never-ending, new-creating love to you through the gift of of his Son and Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we worship you in your terrifying power. You are the God of a majesty and an ability beyond our conception. And we are grateful for that power even when it frightens us because you are not only a God of power but you are a God of goodness and wisdom. And in your power you oppose what will ultimately destroy us. You oppose the chaotic, destructive effects of sin. But you are not only a God of terrifying power, you are a God of renewing covenant love. And you have come to us in your Son. You have entered the mess, the chaos that our sin has made of your good creation. But you've entered that not to just unmake it, but to remake it. And you made us a part of it through what Jesus has done for us. And so I pray that you would help us to have the courage to open our lives to your no. We would open our lives to your opposition to sin and the effects it has on us and those around us. But we would open our lives in repentance because your opposition leads to restoration. Because by your Son, you are breathing on our lives the wind of renewal. Would you give us the hope of that? Would you fill us with the assurance that you remember us? And you will never abandon the promises you have made to us in your Son. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.